Hi, and welcome to episode two of the Parkland Profile. My name is Tony Pearson, and I'm going to be your host for today. Let's get started. To start things off today with Madison Oliver and a segment on what goes into making a tasty breakfast in the morning. Thanks, Maddie. Now we're going on to Cammie with her story on the Parkland family-owned restaurant, Slice of Italy. Lehigh Valley, Allentown, Pennsylvania is known for Dorney Park and Wild Water Kingdom. Our Iron Pigs playing at the Coca-Cola Park. And now our new PPL Center. But smack in the middle is Slice of Italy, owned by one man. Andrew Stefan, I'm the owner of Slice of Italy. Uh, at my time, back in, you know, like in the 1980s, you didn't have to go to high school. You, after, after your middle school, you could have taken trade school. So that's what I did. I took culinary art for two years after my middle school. And uh, at the time, in 1985, my uncle just opened a restaurant in Pittsburgh. And he uh, asked me if I come over there and work for him. So that's what I did. In 1985, I came to the United States when I was 15. And it's because I was going to school. And then after school, was working to 3 p.m. to midnight. Doing a, such a good job at it, you know, working for other people. So in 1994, when I got married, I decided me and my wife opened up our first restaurant. They went to school for two years, which they learned the proper Italian way, because they spoke it before, because we spoke to them, you know what I mean? But by going to school, actually, they learned it the correct way. We started because uh, previous to Slice of Italy, I owned Carini's Italian restaurant. And uh, I owned it for 17 years with my wife, Rosa. 
then uh, we decided to sell it because we needed a break and uh, we took our kids to Italy for two years. You know, we put them in school over there, that way they can learn Italian, you know, and uh, see our culture, our traditions and stuff like that. Then uh, after that, when we come back, which will be three years ago, we decided to open in Lehigh Valley. It's less awkward here because you know everybody and it's more comfortable than other places. And I'm the only one that's ever worked outside of the restaurant, so. What's your favorite pizza? Grandma pizza. <laughs> Why? As the, the combination of the, of the cheese and the garlic and the base, the fresh basil with the tomato sauce, it just has a unique taste. Plus, it's a very thin crust. It's not like a Sicilian, it's a thicker crust. It's a very thin crust. As you can see here, Andrew Stefano is showing me the proper way to make their best-selling pizza. Andrew Stefano instructs me to pat down the pizza gently. I can never be rough with it. I have to give it a little love. It's always good to thin out the crust so you can eliminate the air inside. Cheese is a big part of this dish. You can tell that Andrew Stefano wants me to spread more of the cheese so the grandma's pizza has more flavor to it. And now it is finished. Here we have Slice of Italy's famous grandma's pizza. And I think making people happy by providing the best service, the best food, and you see that smile, because you can tell when somebody liked something, somebody didn't. I think by actually providing, like I said, the best service, the best quality, and treat them like family. Because you can get food anywhere, but not every way you get treated like family. Mm. Try, the food. Try the food. You won't be disappointed. Hopefully not. <laughs> I do not just as a job. For me, it's, it's pride more than anything else. You know, I mean, when we see a people, person smile and say that was the best pizza they ever had or the best entree they ever had, for me, it's more than a paycheck. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, if you're ever craving Italian or you want to check out something new, come and check out Slice of Italy on Tillman Street. Next up, we've got Riley with a how-to claymation where she's going to show us how to make Baymax from Disney's Big Hero 6. Hello, my name is Riley and I'm here to show you how to make Baymax from Big Hero 6. What you'll need is red, black, white, and purple clay. Now let's begin. For his body, you'll need an egg shape, two raindrops for his arms, two cylinders for his feet, a semi-sphere for his head, two small black circles, and a black line. And don't forget his four fingers on each hand. Though there is no order into putting these body parts onto his body, you just need to make sure that his arms are at the pointiest part of the egg and that his feet are at the roundest part of the egg and make sure that his head is between his shoulders. Now place the black line on his head. Then place the two black dots on the end of the each side of the line. Make sure that they are opposite of each other. I'm going to go work on my model of Baymax while you work on yours, so... See you in a bit.
Now that we are finished with the white model of Baymax, we can move on to the armored model of Baymax. And now for the armored model. Make sure you have these shapes cut out. I personally believe that if you have the armored feet and legs, rather than having to roll onto the clay, because this will prevent them from falling off and you won't have like mixed clay. This does not also take any specific order, though I believe if you put the stomach piece on first from the front and the back, that will be making it more realistic. It is your option to put these small accessories onto the armored model or not, I prefer to because it also does look realistic as well. It is also your option to put on the wings, but the wings should also have re support, so make sure you put wires into the wings or else they would fall off, like they did to me. Since its shapes take a while putting on Baymax, I'm going to tell you facts about him. Baymax was inspired by an inflatable robotic arm at Carnegie Mellon University Robotic Institute. Baymax is 7 feet tall and weighs 75 pounds. Did you also know that Frozen, Vault, Leo and Stitch, Record Ralph, movie animators, Iron Man items, actors, and Marvel action figures from their comics were in Big Hero 6? I found that pretty neat. It is very cool how Disney likes to put in cameos from their other movies into their current movie. Disney likes to make their cameos hard to look for, so make sure you look for them, because they are hidden very well. When you are finished with your model, make sure you wash your hands, because red is a very potent color to clay, and it will rub off in your hands and your workspace, so make sure you clean up afterwards. Since we are near the end of finishing up our model, I will now leave you with an animation that I have created of Baymax chasing a soccer ball. Thanks, Riley. Now we've got our very own David A. Guffey with his inspirational piece on the Good Shepherd Rehabilitation Center. The Good Shepherd Home was opened in 1908 by Mama and Papa Raker, taking in orphans and retired Lutheran ministers. Ever since the beginning, the Good Shepherd has sat on the corner of 6th and St. John Street in South Allentown. This statue depicts Conrad Raker, son of Mama and Papa Raker, holding up a resident named Bonnie who has lived there her entire life. This is the Health and Technology Building, the newest addition to Good Shepherd. Raker Center is the home to 99 residents with various different disabilities. Pictures of the Raker family are displayed in the lobby, with Mama and Papa Raker on either side of their son, Conrad. I sat down with one of the residents to talk about her experiences living at Good Shepherd. Sarah Behe and I lived here for about a year and a half. I, the reason why I came here is to get better and eventually walk out of here. My favorite things to do here in Baker Good Shepherd is playing bocce with the residents and with the coaches. It's a Tuesday morning and my other favorite thing is to go to sports happy hour to see what's going on in sports. The reason why I enjoy working here, not working here, living here, is because I love the staff, the residents are wonderful, I get great care, and the therapists are doing wonderful with me because right now, when I first got here, I wasn't even able to walk, and now, 
till this day, I'm start, starting to walk with two canes, half a day and half a day with a walker. Um, I just hang out with residents, staff, talk about, talk about things. This is the gym where physical therapy is provided to the residents. It's located in the basement of Raker Center. This is the view from the catwalk that connects Raker Center to the administration building. This is the multi-purpose room where large group activities are held such as parties, entertainment, and meetings. And now, here's Avery with a view of Parkland.
finally, we're going to move over to Maggie with her special on St. Patrick's Day. The history of St. Patrick's Day started as a celebration for St. Patrick to commemorate him bringing Christianity to Ireland. Today, the traditions include wearing green and shamrocks because St. Patrick was said to have used the shamrock to explain the Holy Trinity to the pagan Irish. Another tradition is music, such as bagpipes, because the Irish use music to remember important events and hold on to their heritage and history. St. Patrick's Day is also known as a feast day in the Church of Ireland, but it only became an official holiday in 1903, according to the Bank Holiday Act of Ireland. Today, however, St. Patrick's Day is not a legal holiday in the United States, and celebrations include the color green, food, and parades. It has been celebrated since the late 18th century. Jim Thorpe just had their 18th annual St. Patrick's Day Parade on March 15th. Thanks for watching. Now I'm going to leave you with another view of Parkland.